Welcome back to The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology. This is the 21st presentation in this series of 30, and today we're discussing Control of Breathing, Part 2. This is The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology, and you can see we're moving along in our series. We want to approach this with the enthusiasm of a child in a candy shop. And again, just to remind you about the respiratory balance, central drive in this case must be adequate to overcome the respiratory load in order to achieve adequate ventilation. If it's inadequate to do so, then you're going to have the balance tipped in this direction, inadequate ventilation or respiratory failure. So today we're going to talk about arousal and cardiac responses. We're going to talk about ventilatory control loop gain. We're going to talk about the hypoxic ventilatory response, um, a little bit different than we did last time. We're going to talk about development of respiratory control. We are, after all, pediatricians. And then just for fun, where in the brain is the ventilatory controller? So arousal and cardiac responses. Uh, a quote from my division head and former fellow, uh, as the same orchestra can play more than one piece of music, so the same ventilatory control centers can orchestrate more than one respiratory response from Sally L. Davidson Ward. So arousal, the forgotten response to respiratory stimulus. This was a um, important pioneering editorial written by Elliot Philipson and Colin Sullivan in 1978. Basically, sleep has profound effects on ventilation. Perhaps, they hypothesize, waking up to avoid a potentially dangerous situation during sleep may be more important than mounting a ventilatory response. Arousal responses appear to be separate from ventilatory responses. So that gives us a construct that looks something like this. Remember, for any neurologic process, we have a sensor, an integrator, and a motor response. We have discussed ventilatory responses to CO2 and hypoxia, both of these input to a ventilatory controller, which integrates information, and minute ventilation is the motor response. There also appears to be, for lack of a better term, an arousal disorder, uh, controller, perhaps the reticular formation. And it turns out that CO2 and low oxygen can also influence arousal where this situation can be integrated and then arousal would be from sleep would be the behavioral response. And these appear to be two separate pathways. So Sally L. Davidson Ward, who was a pulmonary a research fellow actually from 1984 to 86, she looked at apnea, and this is with respect to possible risk for sudden infant death syndrome. And it turns out there are two ways that you can look at apnea. So here we have somebody breathing and they stop breathing. You could look at it this way, in which case you observe somebody stopping breathing. On the other hand, here you have someone who stopped and who started again. And here we've observed somebody who starts breathing again. So we can look at it this way, in which case what we observe is that breathing stops. So if you're going to do research on this, you might ask the question, why does breathing stop? On the other hand, if you look at it this way, you see that someone was not breathing and starts again. So you might ask the research question, why does breathing start? So we talked about um, voluntary control last time, but we didn't emphasize the fact that these central respiratory centers or ventilatory controllers are right near where the reticular formation is thought to be. And the reticular formation is what controls sleep or wakefulness, suggesting that there may be an important influence of sleep on breathing. So how do we study arousal in individuals? Well, we do it something like this. Well, you have somebody who's asleep and you do something to wake them up and see what happens. Dr. Ward and subsequently um, another fellow in our division, uh, Dr. Hamuchu Irsu, um, did studies where they took infants place them under plastic head hood, and decrease the oxygen that they were breathing. So room air is 21% oxygen. They decreased it down to 11% oxygen. Now, 11% oxygen is roughly the uh, inspired oxygen of being at about 10,000 feet elevation. It's not something that is harmful in our opinion, but it is something that the, the child or the baby certainly should notice a difference. 
So this is a picture of a hypoxic ventral response, a number of parameters being measured here. You can see saturation falling by design. Okay, entitled oxygen going down over on this axis here. Heart rate goes up a little bit. Um, CO2 um, decreases a little bit, and there is an increase in respiratory effort here, suggesting that there might be a slight ventral response to hypoxia. But in this particular individual, this individual goes a full three minutes and does not wake up. So we return, uh, basically take the head off, which returns him to P-inspired O2 of 150 and a saturation of, in this case, about, well, it will eventually get up to 100. And this is what she found. Those babies who aroused in response to hypoxia were younger, about 10 weeks um, post-term, compared to those who failed to arouse at about 14 weeks. And if we looked at this a different way, infants who aroused as a percent under age nine weeks, about 50% woke up in response to hypoxia, and over 10 weeks of age, uh, only about 15% woke up. So it's not quite what we expected. We assumed that if hypoxic arousal response was a protective response, it should actually increase with age. Dr. Rafika Humuchu Ursu uh, was a fellow from 1998 to 2001. And she fine tuned this experiment a little bit. She studied three groups of babies, and these were all either normal infants or siblings of SIDS victims who are essentially normal. She studied them at one month of age, which is before the peak incidence of SIDS, at three months of age, which is right at the peak incidence of SIDS, and six months of age, which is after the peak incidence of SIDS. And what she found really uh, confirmed Dr. Ward's findings were that a little over 50% of the one-month-old babies aroused hypoxia, only about 8% of the babies at three months aroused, and none of the babies at six months aroused. So again, this arousal response seemed to be more important when kids were younger. Now, the thing that was interesting is this is the percent of infants arousing to hypoxia, and this is the incidence of SIDS, the blue line. And you can see that blue line peaks, the SIDS incidence peaks at three months, right about where the arousal response has fallen. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this. We don't think that this is the cause of sudden infant death syndrome, but we think it might contribute. So Maida Chen, pulmonary fellow from 2002 to 2005 at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, uh, she looked at ventilatory responses again to hypoxia. Let's start with that. And compared them between controls in the blue and CCA test patients in the red. And as uh, we saw before, I believe, um, the uh, normal response to Hypoxia in a control infant is that minimum ventilation increases linearly as oxygen saturation falls. There's no such response in the um, CCHS patients. Um, this is the VTTI response, or the mean inspiratory flow rate. And again, increase in normals, no real change in the CCHS patient. Maybe a slight slope here, but not really a substantial slope. Certainly very different than the controls. Carol Marcus was a pulmonary fellow from 1987 to 1991. And she looked at the hypoxic arousal response as well. She found that actually the hypoxic arousal response was not a strong response in anybody. Only about 30% of the um, controls aroused to hypoxia, but only one of the 10 CCHS patients aroused, not statistically different. However, she also looked at the cardiac response to hypoxia, and you can see that in both CCHS and controls, there was a significant increase in heart rate um, in response to hypoxia. So this does suggest that even the CCHS patients are sensing hypoxia, and even though they don't respond in a ventilatory manner, they do respond in a cardiac uh, increasing heart rate response manner. Uh, if we plot the cardiac response to hypoxia, this is R to R interval, so it's the reciprocal of rate. So R interval going down is an increased rate. You can see that really the CCHS and controls cross each other. They're the same at different saturations. There is no difference. She also looked at the ventral response to hypercapnia, 
and the controls again had a very brisk response here. CCHS patients did not. VTTI, same thing, brisk response here, no response in the CCHS patients. She looked at hypercapnic arousal responses in these um, babies as well. Uh, this is Dr. Marcus again, sorry. And here's a hypoxic uh, arousal response. You can see CO2 is increased here to an inspired CO2 of 60 tor. And you can see this goes along for only a short period of time before arousal occurs. So CO2, it turns out, is a very potent arousal stimulus. What she showed, uh, sorry, what Dr. Hamucha Irsu showed, remember, she's the one who looked at infants at one month, three months, and six months of age. And she also looked in supine versus prone. There was actually no difference in arousal of CO2 across the board, either supine or prone, or at any of the three months. All right, so CO2 response remains strong, and you can see that they responded. They aroused at a P um, entitled CO2 of really right around 40 there. It was, uh, was not particularly high. Uh, in terms of arousal responses, all, controlled, or, or all controls aroused, um, all but one CCHS patient aroused, not different. The CCHS patients, however, did require a slightly higher inspired CO2 in order for arousal to occur, as you can see there. If we look at cardiac responses to hypercapnia, not as brisk as the hypoxic response. Again, this is our interval, but you can see CCHS and controls uh, overlap here. So that CCHS patients do sense hypoxia and they respond to, respond to it in the cardiac realm by increasing heart rate, but not in the ventilatory rate. And they respond the same as control. So the hypercapnic cardiac response, um, in this case, um, we're now interested in development. So we are pediatricians. And so the question is, what are the ventilatory responses or what are the responses to hypoxia and hypercapnia in children versus adults? This was worked by Carol Marcus. Um, and you can see in her study, the heart rate response was considerably increased this is beats per minute per tour of, um, of oxygen, PO2, uh, was over twice, almost three times as robust as the cardiac response in controls. And uh, this was the correlation coefficient of heart rate to um, PCO2. And you can see that they were not significantly different. So it looks like we have a ventilatory response pathway here and a separate arousal response pathway. Uh, similarly, we have a separate cardiac autonomic nervous system controller, which seems to respond as well. So remember that the CCHS patients have this pathway out, but these pathways seem to be intact. Of course, controls have all of these intact, but the point is that these are separate. Even though central chemoreceptors are shared, the motor responses are different. So CCHS patients who have absent ventilatory responses to oxygen and CO2 have normal arousal and cardiac responses. This suggests that arousal and cardiac responses to respiratory stimuli are mediated differently than ventilatory responses. Let's talk about ventilatory control loop gain briefly. So the ability to maintain P arterial O2 and P arterial CO2 within a normal range depends on tight regulation of multiple feedback loops, known as loop gain. High loop gain responds vigorously to external stimuli, so it results in ventilatory instability and destabilizes the system. Low loop gain responds in a more muted fashion and responds uh, with quick resumption of normal ventilation. High loop gain may be observed in individuals with increased uh, chemosensitivity. For example, high altitude periodic breathing, central sleep apnea, chain stokes ventilation, and obstructive sleep apnea. For those with high loop gain, supplemental oxygen decreases the loop gain and therefore decreases the severity of obstructive apnea. CPAP also stabilizes ventilation by decreasing loop gain, that is, decreasing the CO2 ventilatory response. Increased CO2 acts on central chemoreceptors to increase ventilation. Increased ventilation causes decreased arterial PCO2. Normally, an equilibrium is achieved 
where vent ventilation and PCO2 are stable. In central sleep apnea, however, this is a negative feedback control system, increased ventilation as from an arousal will decrease CO2. After a circulation time, decreased CO2 reaches chemoreceptors, decreasing minute ventilation. Because of the time delay, the decreased ventilation will cause an increased PCO2, which will increase ventilation, et cetera, et cetera, and oscillations in minute ventilation will worsen. So this is an example of somebody with high loop gain. All right. So we have minute ventilation, PCO2, and esophageal pressure as a measure of respiratory effort. So you can see here that uh, if there's a delay in CO2, all right, so we have an increase in ventilation, PCO2 falls, that causes a decrease in ventilation, which increases um, total volume, which decreases CO2 again, which causes an increase in ventilation. And you can see that this uh, augments itself and becomes worse and worse. All right, respiratory effort is increased with this increased ventilation as well. So this is high loop gain, all right? And it's hypothesized at least to be due in part between a time delay between blood hitting the central chemo receptors and causing a change in ventilation. And then that change in ventilation causes a change in PCO2, but it takes a circulation time to reach the chemo receptors. Uh, and so this oscillation persists. So that basically is the concept of loop gain. All right, let's talk about a hypoxic ventilatory response. We're going to go into this in much more detail when we talk about um, high altitude physiology. So what is the effect of acute hypoxia on ventilation during sleep? All right. So hypoxia decreases brain metabolism. Hypoxia stimulates chemoreceptors, which is going to increase minute ventilation. Arterial PCO2, because the increased ventilation here is going to decrease, which decreases ventilation. Cerebral blood flow actually increases in hypoxia. Um, and what's going to happen is that this washes out tissue PCO2 so that it decreases ventilation. And central chemoreceptor function decreases ventilation. So basically recall that at altitude, we have a decrease in total barometric pressure, right? And uh, the PiO2 is always 21% of that, right? So that decreases 21% of total barometric pressure. The climatization of altitude as you first get there, decreased PaO2 stimulates peripheral chemo receptors, which cause increased minute ventilation. This increased minute ventilation causes a decrease in PCO2 and an increase in pH. Decreased PCO2 and increased pH inhibit central chemo receptors, causing decreased minute ventilation. Hypoxic stimulation and hypocapnic inhibition alternate to cause periodic breathing. So what's happening here is we have minute ventilation, all right? Uh, this decreases PCO2. There is a concept called the apneic threshold, uh, which is a CO2 at which one is apneic. You go below the apneic threshold, stop breathing, okay? While you stop, CO2 goes up, oxygen goes down. You cross this threshold, stimulate breathing again, it goes down, and so on over and over again. This periodic breathing is very, very common when you first go to a reasonable altitude, and by reasonable, I'm saying maybe 8,000 feet. From California, if you go to Mammoth, for example, 8,000 feet, I can virtually guarantee on the first night at that altitude, if you watch somebody breathe during sleep, you will see this periodic breathing. And it's due to this mechanism. It does tend to subside with time, so it won't be as dramatic even the second night. So after some time in altitude, CSF hydrogen ion concentration increases. And this increases minute ventilation by central chemoreceptor stimulation. It's basically resetting this to achieve a new increased ventilation baseline. Periodic breathing diminishes, and of course, hemoglobin also increases, which increases oxygen carrying uh, capacity. So the split in phenomenon, I'll give credit to this to Brian Whip, the uh, legendary uh, exercise physiologist, uh, football player, in this case, a USC football player, of course, runs halfway down the field, catches a pass at midfield, and runs it into the end zone for a touchdown. On returning to the bench, he breathes supplemental oxygen for a few minutes. What physiologic benefit, if any, does he gain? Now, I have to say, at least recently, I haven't seen this very often on television, occasionally. 
it used to be that they showed this quite frequently, that uh, players would come back and they would breathe for a minute, couple minutes, some supplemental oxygen on the, on the bench after a run like this. The question is, why do they do that? Does it have a physiologic uh, benefit, if any? So remember, supplemental oxygen does not increase diffusion of oxygen. Supplemental oxygen does not increase oxygen carrying capacity of blood since saturation is already 100% saturated. I'm going to assume that a USC football player has normal lungs going into this. So there, is there a physiologic benefit or is there only psychological benefit? The sprint downfield causes an oxygen debt, decreased pH and dyspnea. Remember, dyspnea in this case is mediated by peripheral chemo receptor stimulation of ventilation due to the acidosis. Supplemental oxygen inhibits peripheral chemo receptor drive, alleviating the dyspnea, and therefore the coach can send the player in on the next play. So there is an effect here. Now think about this for a moment. If you are an endurance athlete running at sea level, is it better to have an increased or decreased hypoxic ventilatory response? What about if you exercise at extreme altitude? We will discuss this in high altitude physiology number two, part two. Coming up, let's talk about the development of ventilatory control. So control of breathing, remember, peripheral chemo receptors respond to low oxygen, stimulate ventilatory controller and minute ventilation. So Carol Marcus, who was a fellow with us uh, 1987 and 1991, she did a study where she looked at 59 children and adults aged 4 to 49. 29 were males, 30 were females, 35 were children, 24 were adults. And she performed rebreathing, hypercapnic, and hypoxic ventilatory responses on each of these individuals, asking the question, is there a developmental pattern? This is the normal ventilatory response to CO2, rebreathing response, and you can see that minute ventilation increases linearly as PCO2 increases. Hypercapnic ventilatory response turned out correlated with uh, uh, weight significantly, with vital capacity significantly, with body surface area significantly, but interestingly, not with height. All right, so Dr. Marcus looked at the hypercapnic ventilatory response um, versus uh, weight, body weight. So obviously the adults are out here, the children are down here, and this is the liters per minute of ventilation per millimeter of mercury uh, PCO2. And you can see that the um, ventilatory response increases some as people age. Not surprising, they have bigger lungs, they're going to breathe more. So to account for disparities in size, volume related results were scaled to body weight. So the hypercapnic ventilatory response versus weight decreased with age with an R value of minus 0.57 at a P less than P001 value. And it was higher in children than in adults. So let's just look at that. So this is the slope of the hypercapnic ventilatory response divided by weight. And you can see that it was higher in children than in adults. Just showing this uh, in graphic form here. So the minute ventilation versus PCO2 um, is shown here, uh, again, corrected for weight. So in children, it's, it's increased compared to adults. And over here, it's increased compared to adults. Uh, this is VTTI, uh, and this is minute ventilation. All right, the ventilatory response to hypoxia linear with respect to O2 saturation, increases with falling saturation. And again, to, dis to account for disparities in size, volume related results were scaled to body weight. And again, the ventilatory response uh, corrected for weight, decreased with age, minus 0.34 R value and P less than 0.05. It was higher, more negative in children than adults. Again, more negative values are stronger ventilatory response. So children had a stronger ventilatory response than adults, and just looked at this way. Uh, again, normalized for um, body weight. This is minute ventilation versus saturation, VTTI versus saturation. In both cases, children had a brisker hypoxic ventilatory response. So hypoxic and hypercapnic ventilatory responses are highest in childhood and decrease through adolescence to adulthood. Increased ventilatory responses may be related to higher metabolic rates. Physiologic amounts of sex hormones 
do not seem to significantly influence ventilatory control, at least with these measures. David Gazal was a pulmonary fellow with us 1990-93. And his question was, does the speed of a hypoxic or hypercapnic challenge affect its ventilatory response? And is there a developmental difference in these responses? What might this tell us about developmental changes in control of breathing? So David studied ventilatory responses in eight children and 11 adults. And you can see the children were about 10, the adults were around 34. None of them had cardiopulmonary disease. They were all studied at least three um, hours after a meal and at least 12 hours after caffeine, chocolate, or any respiratory stimulant. So they were studied in two conditions. The solar ramp condition was a rebreathing ventilatory response, as we've talked about before. The step change was a vital capacity inspiration of 5% CO2 and 95% oxygen, also as we've discussed before. He performed both ramp and step hypercapnic ventilatory responses in pre-pupil children, that is the 10-year-olds, and in adults. So this is an example again of the um, step change hypercapnic response, 15% CO2. You can see obviously an increase in CO2 and a marked increase in ventilation. And these were normalized to minute ventilation and plotted against the CO2. So this is the results. So for children, what you see if we look at minute ventilation versus PCO2, this is the slope of the ramp. This is the slope of the step. I think you can see the ventilation is always higher in the step change than it was in the ramp for each given levels of CO2. This is the adult response. And in this case, I think you can see that the step change is always less than the ramp change for the same CO2. So different patterns there, all right? So if we look at children are in red, adults are in blue, uh, ventilatory response, VE versus entitled CO2, step change much greater in children than the ramp. In adults, the uh, step change much less than the ramp. This is VTTI, same thing. Um, step change much greater than the ramp in children. Um, in this case, the, uh, in adults, the step change was a little bit higher than the um, than the ramp change uh, in the adults. So this uh, plots the slope of the step change for children, the open circles, and for adults, the uh, squares against the ramp change. So basically what you can see is that children always had a lower slope of their ramp change than step change. Adults always had a higher slope of their ramp change than their step change. So that's pretty different. So children, the slopes of the step response were always greater than slope of the ramp. Adults slope of the step change were always less than the slopes of the ramp. The ramp CO2 response is due to central chemoreceptors, whereas the step change response are due to peripheral chemoreceptors. Uh, he did the similar sort of comparison with um, hypoxic ventilatory responses, ramp versus step, uh, performed both in pupil children and adults. This is an example of the uh, five breath, 100% nitrogen breathing, and you can see there is an increase here in uh, flow and in tidal volume. So this is the hypoxic ventilatory response, all right? And again, you can see the ramp is always less than the step, all right, for ventilation with decreasing sap. In the adult, the step is always less than the ramp. Again, for the child, the step, is less is greater than the ramp for the adult the step is less than the ramp for the child uh, and this is ve this is vtti same um, sort of situation uh, this again just plots remember that a negative response is more powerful so more negative uh, values are strong response and again children the um, uh, ramp is always less than the step and in adults, the um, step is always less than the ramp. So children's slopes of step hypoxic response are always greater than the slopes of the ramp. Adults' slope of the step hypoxic response are always less than the slopes of the ramp. Hypoxic and CO2 ventilatory responses vary depending on ramp or step presentation. Children have increased responses to step 
adults have increased responses to RAM. The peripheral chemo receptor responsiveness is increased in children compared to adults, and increased peripheral chemo receptor tone may play a role in the increased donator responses in children actually across the board here, not just in the step. The neonate, and particularly the preterm infant, breathes irregularly. There is great variability in ventilation. In periodic breathing, irregular and active sleep. Active sleep is REM sleep. The resting ventilatory pattern of the neonate is not otherwise sleep state dependent. So hypercapnia increases minute ventilation in both quiet sleep and active sleep. Ventilatory response to steady state hypercapnia is the same in quiet and active sleep. Periodic breathing diminishes with hypercapnia, presumably due to increased central drive. So this shows uh, term infants and preterm infants. A uh, ventilatory response, uh, in this case, to PCO2, right? And you can see term infants, really not much difference, actually, between active and quiet sleep. Preterm infants um, do require, if you will, a higher PCO2 to achieve the same minute ventilation. Hypoxia in, in neonates, hypoxia causes an immediate increase in minute ventilation, followed by a later decrease. So responses, again, are similar in wakefulness, active, and quiet sleep. Adults have a sustained increase in minute ventilation and response to hypoxia. The initial uh, increase is due to peripheral chemo receptor stimulation. But in infants, the late response depression may due to, be due to direct CNS depression. The blue indicates adults, who in this case are exposed to from 15 to 12 percent, and you can see that with hypoxia, ventilation goes up and stays up. Preterm infants, however, um, have an initial increase due to peripheral chemo receptor function and then a fall due to um, presumably um, direct cerebral inhibition from hypoxia. So the late depression of minute ventilation is profound in neonates and especially in preterm infants. Uh, hypoxia causes apnea in neonates. Conversely, supplemental oxygen often diminishes both central and obstructive apneas in neonates. So the mechanisms of control of breathing are similar in adults, but some aspects make this control unique. Sleep has a profound effect. Neonates are profoundly sensitive to hypoxia, which decreases ventilation even after initial increase due to peripheral chemo receptor stimulation. So finally, where in the brain is the ventilatory controller? For fun, we actually drew a, a diagram here of the brain and suggested that the uh, ventilatory controller was loosely somewhere in this area. But where is it? Can we actually find it? CCHS, congenital central hypoventilation syndrome, is an experiment of nature where patients have no ventilatory response to hypoxia or hypercapnia. We can do functional MRIs on these patients to determine what parts of the brain are activated, well, on anybody, to determine what parts of the brain are activated during hypercapnia. And then we can compare the fMRI of controls versus CCHS. And where CCHS is missing, that controls do activate, is where the ventilatory controller is. So remember, respiratory responses in CCHS, arousal responses are intact. So that means that central chemo receptors do have some function. But the ventilatory controller is what's out. So basically, this is the area, presumably, that would differ in fMRI between controls and CCHS. What is missing in CCHS? Ventilatory controller function is absent, but intact in controls. So the difference between fMRI hypercapnic activated areas in controls versus CCHS is where the ventilatory controller lies. So this is work done primarily by Ron Harper who is a professor of neurosciences in the Brain Research Institute at UCLA. And uh, he was really generous enough to invite me to participate in this, mostly by um, identifying potential subjects for this. Now, we agree on a lot of things, but not entirely on everything. UCLA and USC are the biggest football rivalries, perhaps, in the country. Using functional MRI, can we visualize parts of the brain activated by hypercapnia or hypoxia? So what was done was to perform baseline uh, MRI on the brain, perform repeat MRI while breathing 5% inspired CO2. And then the difference is where neural activation and response to hypercapnia occurs in the brain. 
to identify the ventilatory controller, which is absent function of the CCHS, we compare the fMRI in normal subjects versus or CCHS. So here is one of the crude scans. And the difference that you're looking at here is the cerebellum. Right? Note a lot of activation and controls, not much um, in the CCHS. And if we fine tune this a little bit, you can see that there are areas of activation in controls which are absent in CCHS. And this is primarily in the cerebellum. Now, textbooks of respiratory physiology do not, do not generally mention the cerebellum as something active in control of breathing. But the cerebellum does have a stabilizing influence on a lot of neural responses. So it's not far-fetched to think that the cerebellum might be important in control of breathing. There were some other differences. Limbic regions and thalamic regions were also different between CCHS and controls. Okay, and so missing areas as you see here. And furthermore, a different type of MRI scans called T2 weighting uh, showed differences between T uh, CCHS and controls, and high T2 values indicate absence of fiber development, diminished myelination, or decreased cell density. So if you look at this, cerebellum and these limbic thalamic areas that we talked about before suggest there actually may be some damage in some of these um, CCHS patients. Basal ganglia, ganglia, limbic and cortical structural defects in CCHS versus controls is shown here. First, where's the ventilatory controller? It's not just in the brainstem. Some brain regions activated by hypercapnia are not usually considered to mediate ventilatory drive, like the cerebellum. But hypercapnia chemoreception is intact in CCHS. Motor output is intact in CCHS. Thus, the deficits much li must lie in integrating input and output processes. These results tell us something about normal control of breathing. Deficient cerebellar regulation of outflow, autonomic outflow, may be important in such disorders as SIDS. So we hypothesize that the cerebellum may play a crucial role in integrating chemoreceptor signals with appropriate motor output, not previously rec recognized as important in ventilatory control. So subsequently, based on this, Meta Chen did a study, a retrospective chart review of 36 children who'd had their cerebellum resected because of tumors. Unfortunately, nobody was thinking about respiratory control problems, so it was hard to dig things out. But even without people thinking about this specifically, 19% had elevated PCO2 post-op, 17% had apnea bradycardia post-op, 7% required intubation and mechanical assisted ventilation somewhat prolonged following surgery, and prolonged ventilatory support, 7.3 weeks, was required in one patient. So there is some evidence here of disordered ventilatory control due to absent cerebellar coordination of ventilation, at least in this retrospective study. So what have we learned? There are both voluntary and metabolic control of breathing systems, Central chemo receptors respond to small changes in PCO2 and are actually responsible for breathing minutes a minute. Minute ventilation increases linearly with PCO2. Peripheral chemo receptors respond to hypoxia and large changes in PCO2 or pH. Minute ventilation increases exponentially for decreasing PO2 below 60. So this is not responsible for uh, breathing minutes a minute, but is a backup system if your PO2 falls significantly. Conversely, minute ventilation increases linearly with decreasing saturation linearly. Breathing is too important at one control system, so we explored central chemo receptors, peripheral chemo receptors, lung receptors, chest wall receptors, cortical influences on breathing, voluntary breathing, and a few more to come up. Hypoxia and hypercapnia also mediate cardiac and arousal responses. Hypoxic ventilatory responses are a complex interaction of central and peripheral chemo receptor input. Children have increased hypoxic and hypercapnic ventilatory response compared to adults, and many parts of the brain participate in control of breathing, not just the brainstem. So this basically is the basis of control of breathing here, chemoreceptor input to a ventilatory controller and motor output. So next time, we're going to leave specific systems now and talk about upcoming three environmental 
influence us on breathing. The first one is going to be effects of sleep on breathing in three parts. Then we'll talk about exercise and finally high altitude physiology. But next time we'll talk about the effects of sleep on breathing. Thanks again to our director producer, Katie LeWinter. And thank you again for joining me for the great adventure, pediatric pulmonary physiology.